This episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes, therapynotes.com. Be sure and check them out and be sure and use the promo code Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N, and you can try them out for two months for free. A little over 15 years ago, when I started my private practice, I had to learn a lot and most of it the hard way. And I don't think you need to do the same. Hi, I'm Gordon Brewer, a licensed psychotherapist, and welcome to the Practice of Therapy podcast, part of the Psychcraft Network of Podcasts. Join me in this journey of discovery as we have conversations with other leaders and professionals in both the mental and allied health fields. Join us as we explore both the business and clinical sides of running a private practice. Hello, folks, and welcome to the podcast. This is episode number 289 of the Practice of Therapy podcast. I'm Gordon Brewer, and glad you're with us. And if this is your first time listening to the podcast, hope you'll come back for more and take time to follow us. So in this episode, I take a little bit of a, I don't guess it's fair to say a detour, but uh, this is not necessarily my typical guest, but I interview a person by the name of David Nagel, and David is an entrepreneur and business person, and what we talk about is mindset, and um, David was one of those folks that reached out to me and recognized that um, a lot of times in in his work as a consultant and and an entrepreneur, that he runs into a lot of us therapist types that just have trouble with our money mindset. And I would happen to do, to agree with that because um, I know that's something I've struggled with in the past myself is just how we think about money and our relationship to money and what we charge people and feeling like um, we have to undercut ourselves or that our services and what we do is not valued as much. Um, I don't know if that's something that's ingrained in graduate school as much or as just stuff that we grow up with, but... Anyway, those of us that are therapists and counselors, um, we do tend to be very generous and kind people. And somehow or another, we tend to t- seem to think that if we don't, uh, we're being kinder if we don't charge as much or don't charge uh, our, you know, charge for our services. So anyway, I don't want to get too much on my soapbox on that, but um, anyway, I'm looking forward to you hearing my conversation with David, and I thought hopefully it'll give you some things to think about in terms of your own mindset, not only about money, but just about business in general and just life in general. So uh, it, it was a great conversation. But before we get to that, I'd love for you to go over and find out more about my next cohort of the group practice focus group. So if you are in um, a group practice, in particular, maybe a smaller group practice, and when I say smaller, I would say 10 or fewer clinicians in your practice, I'd love for you to go over and find out about this next cohort of the focus group that I've started this past year. Uh, Our first cohort met the first six months of this year. Great group of people. We learned a lot from each other and helped each other a lot. You know, some of the, uh, ironically, some of the issues that came up for a lot of us uh, or some of the folks in the group were just money mindset and thinking about that differently and what we pay people. But this uh, this focus group, or AKA Mastermind, is specifically for those folks that are smaller group practices, but also insurance-based because there are a lot of us out here that uh, accept insurance, and, and it's mainly because of the demographics of our area and might be just kind of our own convert, uh, own personal convictions about that particular topic. But um, anyway, love for you to check it out. So if you'll go over to practiceoftherapy.com slash focus group, you can find out more about that. And um, love to have a conversation with you about that and have you join this next cohort. 
So, and um, the other thing I'll mention here that I'm still working on, and if any of you have signed up for this free resource, it's uh, the podcast workshop resource. It's the podcasting workshop that I've put together. It's a free email series that you'll get from me with uh, some short tutorials and lessons on how to start a podcast. One of the things that has really taken off for me this year is the Sitecraft Network, which was a uh, podcasting network that I started last year, and um, we're we're really growing. We've had a lot of new good additions to the network. One you're going to get to hear from here soon, Patrick Cassell, with the All Things Private Practice uh, um uh, podcast. And if you don't know about Patrick's podcast, check it out. Um, but Patrick's part of our network now. And um, let's see, a few others have joined as well. So go over to prac, uh, excuse me, go over to sitecraftnetwork.com and check out all the podcasts that are part of the network. So, and real quickly here, before we get to my conversation with David, love for you to hear from one of the members of the Sitecraft Network and also Therapy Notes, our sponsor. Hey there, I'm Chris McDonald. And if you don't know me yet, I'm host of the Holistic Counseling Podcast, which is for therapists who want to deepen their knowledge of holistic modalities and build their practice with confidence. The Holistic Counseling Podcast is proudly part of the Sitecraft Podcast Network, a network of podcasts focused on helping people live more meaningful and productive lives. Join me each week as we explore the best practices for integrating holistic approaches into therapy and delve into the many benefits. Whether you're looking for new techniques or seeking to deepen your own personal journey towards wellness, this podcast is the perfect companion for your holistic path. If you haven't listened yet, you can find it over at holisticcounselingpodcast.com and discover other resources, including products, books, and other trainings to help support you in your holistic journey. One of the keys to a successful private practice is having the right systems and processes in place to make things run as smoothly as possible. With a system like Therapy Notes, you'll have more time to spend with what matters most, your clients. Therapy Notes is a complete practice management system with everything you need to manage patient records, schedule appointments, meet with patients remotely, create rich documentation, and bill insurance right at your fingertips. Their streamlined software is accessible wherever and whenever you need it. Your clinical records will be secure with less paperwork, which means you can give a much better quality of care. It's the EHR that Gordon uses in his practice. Be sure to check them out today by going to practiceoftherapy.com slash therapy notes. And be sure to use the promo code Gordon to get two months free. Hello, everyone, and welcome again to the podcast. And I'm happy for you to get to know today, David Nagel. Welcome, David. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be yeah. here. Yes, yes. And so David's one of those good folks that reached out to me. And after chatting with him, I feel like what he brings is going to be really interesting to folks, just thinking about our mindset and how we do things and, you know, maybe how we can grow faster with our with our practices. So David, as I talk, I start with everyone, why don't you tell folks a little more about yourself and how you've landed where you've landed? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So as we were talking about off air, I'm from Chicago. I grew up on the streets of Chicago. My parents got divorced when I was relatively young. Uh, They weren't around very much. So I really didn't have a whole lot of guidance in my life. And I quit high school when I was in set when I was 17, got married very young, I had a couple of kids and found myself in a situation where I couldn't live up to the responsibility that I created for myself. And I was, mm. I didn't have any skill sets either. I was driving a forklift on a dock and I, and I drove a truck on the weekends. So I was working about 16 or I was working about six and a half days a week. And I was desperately trying to find a way to break out of that problem that I created. And in, for a, over a period of about two years, I was trying to do everything that I could to get out of the situation. And it was just getting worse. It was progressively getting worse. Woke up in the morning, my car was repossessed. 
We had to leave. We had to move out of our apartment in the middle of the night. They wouldn't let us out of our lease. We couldn't afford to live there anymore. Had to move 60 miles away to not a favorable neighborhood um, Mm. where we live next door to a drug dealer that used to beat his wife on a regular basis. I mean, it was Mm. was bad. And we went bankrupt. We went totally bankrupt, right? I'm in my very early 20s. It was not a good start. And for this period of time, I'm trying to figure out any kind of way to change this around. Now, the, here was the where I was getting stuck. I was thinking that the mistake that I made was quitting high school and that I needed to go back and get an education in order to have a skill so that I could be employable somewhere. So I was, and I didn't have any money and I didn't have any time to do it. So I was trying to figure out how do I get more money and more time? That was for two years. I was spending all my energy on trying to figure out how to open that door to get, to get someplace. Of course, this is before the internet, right? You had to go to a community Mm -hmm. college, what, you know, that type of thing. And then about two years into this, into this struggle, I I just, like I said, it was progressively getting worse as I was going. And I had a really, really bad day. Uh, I got in trouble twice before I even punched in at work. Uh, It was brutally cold. I was absolutely exhausted. My spouse was complaining about the situation that we were in. And it was one of those days where just everything's going wrong, right? It just couldn't get worse. And I um, was on a forklift in the back of a trailer and I just broke down crying. Mm -hmm. And I was like, God, please show me something. I can't take this anymore. I don't know what to do. Everything I'm doing is the wrong thing to do. Show me what to do. And I heard this voice in my head that said, change your attitude. And it was loud and it was clear and it was distinct. And it snapped me out of me losing composure. And I sat there for a few minutes and I thought about it. And I thought to myself, is it possible that this, if I was to work on that, it would change the situation that I'm in? And of course, I got this other voice in my head going, David, that's the craziest thing you've ever thought. There's no way that's going to change this situation. But I also remembered that I had heard that many times before as a kid because I wasn't a good uh, student in school. And, of course, my parents would get called in and the teacher would say, David's a pretty bright guy, but he's got a terrible attitude when it comes to doing the schoolwork. And if he would change that, he would do relatively well. But it never changed. That attitude Mm -hmm. never changed. But my parents never taught me how to change it either. They didn't teach me how to change it. Nobody taught me how to study they didn't understand what my difficulties were in school and show me how to work around those things. Nothing. It was, it was, I would get grounded from one report card to another when I would, when I would come home. And I spent my whole childhood like this. So I started thinking, okay, let me, let me work on this attitude thing. What is it? Cause I'm not even sure I know what an attitude is. And I looked at a gentleman that owned the company that I worked for. And at the time, I was working for the largest food importer in the United States. And this guy started the business in his garage. So for some reason, I kind of related to him, probably because it seemed like he didn't have such a head start. I didn't know anything about successful people, never been around a successful person, Mm -hmm. nothing. As a matter of fact, most of the knowledge that I had about successful people was negative hearsay that I heard growing up. So I thought, Mm -hmm. what's the difference between him and me? And I thought, okay, well, if he started this in his garage and he's built it to this huge company, he must have loved what he did to some degree. And I was looking at the fact of what I knew I didn't have. I hated what I was doing. Hated it, hated it. Hey, every day I would wake up and I'd be like, I hate this and just had a negative perspective about it all day. So I thought, okay, well, he must have loved it. So that's one difference. Number two, he must have done a really good job because he built it from this little company that he had in his garage until this huge company that supplies half the United States with imported foods from around the world. And three was this really weird experience that I had with him. So back in that day, he had one of the first almost fully automated warehouses that there were. Wow. And all these different CEOs from other companies would come into the warehouse and he would give tours of of this place. And they were all in their suits and, you know, all of us others are working, you know, working, sweating, freezing, whatever the weather was in the warehouse. 85% of the people in the warehouse didn't even speak English. And he would never walk past somebody without stopping and saying, hello, how are you? How's your day? How's your family? 
that type of thing. And I thought to myself, that is such a huge contradiction from what I've heard about successful people in my life. Mm -hmm. I grew up with this working class attitude of the man is keeping everybody down and the haves and the have nots and, you know, all this separation and stuff. And that basically these guys, these guys were real jerks. And that's, that was not my experience with him. So the third thing that I recognized was that he treated everybody with total respect. It didn't matter where you were mm -hmm. on the pole, right? Everybody got respect. So I thought, okay, I'm going to try to change those three things and I'm going to stick to it for a year. I'm going to act like I love what I do. I'm going to try to do everything to the best of my ability, which I really didn't even know what that entailed because nobody helped me ever do that before. And I was going to treat people with total respect. Now, when I made the decision, 30 days after I made the decision, I was making $62,000, 62500 a year. Wow. And everything changed so fast that I it paused me. And I thought to myself, what did I just do? Because if mm -hmm. I could make this kind of a significant change with a poor work, work record, with no education, with previously having a terrible attitude, getting in all kinds of trouble, what could I do if I actually knew what I was doing? Now, everybody around me, they couldn't explain what happened to me either. They were all saying that I got lucky and I should you know, stick with this luck wherever I was going for the rest of my life. Don't screw this up like you've screwed everything else up before, that type yeah. of thing. And I'm like, no, there's something else here. But I didn't know anybody that could explain it to me. So I started going to the library and I started picking up books, biographies. I was determined to find out, to learn about myself and figure out what it was that I had done and how do I replicate it? How do I grow it? How do mm -hmm. I pass through this in my life? And of course, then it led me to uh, cassette tapes on you know, books on tape and biographies on tape and seminars. And I eventually met my mentor around 1996. And I studied for a period of seven years. Now, the company that I went to work for that day, I started off as a truck driver and I never went back to school. But seven years later, I was in charge of expanding that company across the country. Wow. And it was just through maintaining the attitude keeping those three core attitudes and beliefs very close and, you know, holding myself to a higher standard constantly. Seven years later, I decided that I was going to start my own business. I just loved what I had learned so much. And the other thing was that I had this experience where people would come up to me, you know, on the sly and they'd be like, dude, what are you doing? Like, mm -hmm. because they knew me most of my life. A lot of these people, what are you doing? How do you, how is this even possible that you went from this mm -hmm. place. Now you've got this success, you know, what's going on. And I would try to share with them what I did and the ones that would listen, they would start changing their lives. Of course, the ones that didn't, didn't do anything, but I thought there's something here. I've got something, mm -hmm. here, right. I've got, I've got something that's valuable in the marketplace. I always wanted to have my own business ever since I was a kid, but I didn't know what to do. So that, then I started down this road and that was 20, 24 years ago, this October will be 24 years mm -hmm. that we've been in business. And it's just been a fantastic journey. I mean, we've been teaching people in small business all over the world. They speak all over the world. And we do work with corporations to some degree uh, yeah. as needed. But that's that was the journey. Yeah, yeah. So what uh, I'm curious as to what, how did, other than changing your attitude and kind of your outlook about the job and all of that sort of thing, what were the other things that tended to happen as a result of that that caused it to move quicker for you? Well, the main thing was that I realized that my entire belief system was based on living a life that was of non-risk and safety, right? Mm -hmm. The entire middle class, working class, their value system and most of their beliefs are about helping them make it from birth to death without getting themselves into too much trouble. It's not really about expanding their life. It's just hanging on to the little bit that they've got. And as I slowly got introduced to this, I saw so many what I call value conflicts, right? Like I would hear different things and I'd be like, I don't, that's not what I was raised to believe. How can this be true? And I would investigate it, investigate it and find out that it is. One of the things was about money. Like 
the the conflicting beliefs that most people have about money is absolutely atrocious and it keeps them completely broke because if you dig into it it's almost like this necessary evil right it, like you have to have money to survive but you don't want to have too much or you're greedy you don't want to go too big or because what if you fall you don't want to get disappointed mm-hmm. and and the the nonsensical belief that you've got to work hard and long to make a lot of money is the, one of the biggest lies that has ever been portrayed on on mankind it just keeps them so stuck it's unreal the truth is the more money you make the easier it actually is those were some of the basics that change. right right yeah and that's a i think that's one of the things that folks that have listened to me for a while now you know i think a lot of us struggle with our money mindset you know i've heard if people that again people that have been listening to the podcast my dad god love him was a terrible money manager and never really learned how to how to take money and have it work for him as yeah. opposed to just it being this this commodity that was scarce and that you just hung on to it and you know and then if you needed more you just go into debt kind of thing and so that yeah. was that was a big shift for me and just thinking about my mindset around money. And I think too, just a lot of people, like you alluded to, grow up with a lot of money shame. You know, it's kind of like if you've got too much money, then something's, you know, you're you're the bad guy or yes. Know, yeah. All of that yes. sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. To such yeah. a severe degree that one of the things that I was just completely shocked by was that as I began to work with people all over, all different kinds of people, I was, as they were, as they would start to become successful, they were getting rejected by their families. Yes. As soon as they uh-huh. started to pass the level of the family, they were getting rejected. And the beliefs that were behind that were just, they were, they were so steeped in ignorance. It was unbelievable, but it also caused a real conflict in the person. Like, do I go after my success and really live the life that I want? Or do I play it close to the vest so that my family's not upset? And mm-hmm. so many people, you know, it's kind of interesting. We all, I think we all unconsciously know to some degree whether or not our family is going to accept if we actually become really successful. Because we were, we grew up in those families. We heard what their views are, right? Mm-hmm. So if we start to surpass that and we start to get rejected for it, it's like we go back into our five-year-old body and then we don't, you know, we collapse on ourselves. We, we literally self-sabotage at that point. Right, right. Yeah, just that whole... That whole money, Shane, there's a saying we have here in the South is don't get above your raising. And that's, uh, yeah. yeah. And so that's, yeah, kind of that same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So if if, uh, thinking about all of this, David, what do you find is a good starting place for people in thinking about changing their money mindset or changing the way that they think about growing their business? Those kinds of things. I think it has to start with the with this first belief. Most of us were raised that we can't have what we want. And until that changes, we'll sabotage at that level, which keeps people not getting to experience enough success to really believe in themselves that they can do it. Because that beginning journey, you have to accept failure, right? And it's mm-hmm. another thing. There, there, we were raised in a society that as children, because they're preparing us to go to work for somebody else, failure is not tolerated, right? You're lazy. You're not working hard enough. You're not dedicated. You're not disciplined. Failure is essential if you're going to have success beyond your own self-preservation, where you're really going to expand in your life. And, and failure is a lesson. It's not, it's not something that should be looked at from a negative perspective, mm-hmm. but the, the hardest question that I've seen in the 30 years that I've been studying, 24 years that I've been in business, is people honestly being an, to answer what they honestly want. Like, what do they really want? They'll tell you what they think mm-hmm. they can do, which is based on the past. They'll tell you what they think they should do, which is based on their family and their social unit. But they've never really considered or allowed themselves to consider hands down, what do I want in life? Like I have the ability to create my life. What do I want? That question just trips people up to no end. But if you can start to answer even just a little bit, it will start opening doors for you. Because it's like, once the student's ready, the teacher will appear, right? I truly Mm -hmm. believe that for that are going to take you 
take you further if you just keep walking through those open doors. But I think it's the first one. I think you have to you have to want something beyond the situation that you're in. And it needs to be something that is that's really coming from the desire of your heart, not something that you think you should do or that you're being pressured by somebody else or society to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think a few things that you said have said so far that just kind of stand out for me is is one is the the fear of failure. And, you know, just kind of looking at it from putting my clinical hat on, you know, one of the things about for people to grow, they have to get outside their comfort zone. Yeah. And and so that they have to, but the other thing is, is that it's also through like you it, I'm repeating what you said, but it's through failure that we learn is that we figure out other it's, it's what causes us to think in different ways. I agree. You know, yeah. it's, it, I think it's the failure and the judgment. Mm -hmm. When I realized or when I came to this belief that I had made a mistake by quitting high school, I'm not so sure that it was a mistake now that I look back at it. But at the time, it sure seemed like that was the big one. I started going to people and asking them because I didn't know what to do. I honestly did not know how, like I felt so caged in by my mistake. I didn't know how to break out. And every person that I went to said the same damn thing to me. Told you so told you not to quit. Yeah. What do you think was going to happen? Not one person in my family, in my environment gave me any kind of real direction. Like, okay, you messed up, but here's what you do now. Right. Not one person. Yeah. And that, I think that's a part of that has to start with ourselves and being able to, to bypass those negative messages that, that are limiting in that way. You know, it's, a, you know, again, just thinking about it from just kind of the therapist perspective here, you know, a lot of times when we, one of the things that comes to mind for me is just working with people that are struggling with some sort of addiction. Yeah. And, and the people that succeed in recovery are those people that don't let what has happened to them in the past determine what they're going to do in the future. And so, yeah, it's the same thing that you're, you're talking about is, is that if you, if you had stuck, if you'd stuck with that thought or that idea that, okay, I didn't finish high school. So that's the period at the end of the sentence, you would, you would still be doing what you were doing. You yeah. wouldn't, you wouldn't get past that. And yeah, I think uh, I was very fortunate with the idea that I started when from the day that I sat in that trailer and thought to myself, okay, who do I know that has a better attitude than me? I started learning from successful people that day, that night. Mm -hmm, in that trailer. Mm -hmm. And and I always kept that focus because I realized, and I didn't, I don't think I understood near the implications of this, but I did realize that nobody that I knew had the ability to help me because they had mm -hmm. never been where I wanted to go. They dealt with the same problems I was dealing with. Mine were just worse because they were, it seemed to be more final in the decision, you know, yeah. but once I started doing that, I started seeing how people made decisions very differently than I was raised. And that, mm -hmm. again, it was not letting my past hold me back, but looking forward into the future and be like, what could I possibly do? And slowly, but surely I stepped my way out of that situation. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can you think of an example of a decision maybe that you made differently that you that you changed? Well, so in the very beginning, the decision was that, so the, this other voice in my head that I mentioned earlier was, you're never going to do this. You've never stuck to anything in your life. Of course, that's what I always heard from my parents. You don't stick to anything. You don't stick to anything. Well, I hadn't found anything I was interested in either, right? And I knew that if I was interested in something that it wasn't difficult for me to do it. There were a couple subjects in school that I was very fascinated with, and I did really well, but everything else was horrible. So I said, I'm going to do this for a year. I'm going to stick to this for a year. I'm really going to do it. And of course, that that voice is going, no, you're not. You, you've never stuck to anything. There's no way you're going to do this. So the first decision was that I was going to be that person every day. And even though I didn't, I knew, I, I consciously knew that I was acting that part. Right. And so mm -hmm. I would literally think things in my mind and try to associate things that I loved in my life with being that individual. I started thinking about some things that I wanted. There, 
I heard somebody say, and I, I have thought about this for a long time. I don't remember where I picked this up, but it was around that time. I heard somebody talk about goals and they said, write down a hundred goals. Right. And I'm thinking a hundred goals. Like, I don't, you know, I have, there's no way I could get to a hundred that the exercise almost stopped me because of how big the exercise was. I could only think of three things that I wanted. I wanted to buy a house for my family. That was very, very important to me. Mm -hmm. As something personally that I wanted, I wanted to buy my own boat. I grew up hunting and fishing uh, in Wisconsin all the summers of my youth. And we never had, we never had the money to have our own boat. We always had to rent a rowboat or something. And I always wanted to own my own. So there was that. And then I thought I was kind of, I was kind of trying to mirror somebody else's life. And I had an uncle that he, his plan was basically to do those things. He had a boat, he bought property up in Wisconsin. He was building a cabin, a place that he could go and retire to. And I thought that's my long-term vision, right? If I can get some property and build mm-hmm. something up there at some point, I'll be really lucky if I could, if I could do that. And those were the images that I held in my mind of what it is that I wanted, that I was working for. But first and foremost, it was that house. I wanted that house. I wanted to get my family out of that neighborhood so bad. I would go home and I would just be so humiliated. I would cry in the car before I would get out of the car. Mm -hmm. I felt like this is all my responsibility. I screwed this up. I've got to get us, I've got to get us out of this. So that was the, that was the first one. And then I decided that I was going to study every day. So the, where I went to work was a hundred miles from where I lived. And I was willing to do that because that was the place where I could afford a house in a decent neighborhood. And this was the job that I had that actually paid me enough money to live in any kind of house at all. So I got rid of, I was, I loved music like growing up, like what teenager doesn't, right? Mm-hmm. I got rid of all the music out of my car and I, I replaced it with books on tape and I studied. So it was an hour and a half drive to work and an hour and a half drive home. So three hours a day, I studied for seven years. I didn't miss I did. I gave, I gave everything else up. I didn't go to movies unless it had to do with the kids or the family. I was either studying or at work. I was determined to learn enough about me so that I had the ability to change my situation. And that was in the beginning. And then hiring a mentor was the next best. That was the next thing that moved me forward significantly because that took me over a million. That well, that made me a multimillionaire relatively quick. And that was a huge step because I was still working for myself. So I had to take out like a, a second mortgage to be able to pay for mm-hmm. it, and credit cards. But I was just determined that this is the road that I was going to go. And it, hadn't I done those things, I wouldn't have never started the business right. for myself. Yeah. 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 So it, uh, what, one is being clear on what it is that you want, even if it, it that, that probably, and I, I would guess that that can change for people over time, what you want initially oh, sure. isn't necessarily what you're going to want later on, but you were clear on that. And then the, the other part of it too, is I like to call it persistence and consistency. And so you were persistent and consistent with what you did. And I, I would guess too, David, that there was maybe part of this and you correct me if I'm wrong, is that you recognize that it wasn't going to necessarily happen really quickly, but you were just going to do it in small bites and just be consistent with that. Yes, absolutely. I was determined. Well, like I said, I gave myself a year at the first time that I made the decision, right? I had, Mm -hmm. and I was not looking at anything that would, you would consider really abundant. I just wanted a small house for us to live in. It was no extravagant goal, Mm -hmm. obviously setting goals within what I thought I could accomplish. And even that was a, a bit of a stretch. The the i the the goals and the and everything it, it it began to pick up speed once i built a foundation of understanding and i was really internalizing knowledge and being able to practice it and develop the disciplines and begin and beginning to master that in my life all right right so if somebody's struggling with figuring out what it is they want what what advice would you give them so what i do with all my clients is i have them start exactly where they are what the first thing i do is have them go through their life and see where they're denying themselves things that they want, right? I don't care what the justification or the excuse is, but start writing down what it is you're not letting yourself have that you actually want. And then I, it's like 
you need to give yourself permission to not only want it, but to go be it, do it, or have it, whatever it is. And you need to open up that desire inside of yourself. Because to me, in my experience, it is the first thing that catapults a person onto that journey of their life, following that desire of their heart. I'm a firm believer that we all have a purpose in this life and that we're not the only form of nature that doesn't have guidance to it. We just were taught not to listen to it. And Mm -hmm learn how to listen to it, it'll take us on that journey of what our life is supposed to be about. Right, right. I'm reminded of a quote by a guy by the name of Joseph Campbell. And he was he was a philosopher and teacher of mythology and compared to religions. But uh, it's his favorite quote of mine is follow your bliss. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing the quote, follow your bliss and doors will open for you where you didn't realize there were even doors. And so yeah, yeah. the hero's journey, right? Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah, so that's great. So, well, David, I've got to be respectful of your time, but tell folks more about your things and how they can get in touch with you and all of that. Just listen to our podcast, the Successful Mind Podcast. It's free. You don't have to subscribe, and you'll get a really good rounded idea of what it is that we do and and what we're all about. Or you could go to davidnagel.com. That's our website. Our life is now inc.com. Mm-hmm. So that's our website. Those are the places to get a hold of us and, and see what we got going on. Awesome. Well, David, thanks for being on the podcast and hope we can have another conversation here soon. Well, a big thanks to David and telling his story just about his entrepreneurial journey and some of the things that he's discovered. I, I think a lot of times we can um, we cannot know where we are with things without looking at our mindset, um, and I don't think we need to take that for granted. So, but anyway, thanks to David for joining me on the podcast. Be sure and check out his things. You can find links in the show notes and the show summary. And um, I love having these kinds of conversations with, with folks. Also, be sure and find out more about the group practice focus group. And the next core, cohort is starting this month. And um, love for you to apply and sign up for that. And you can go to practiceoftherapy.com slash focus group. And this this focus group or AKA mastermind is specifically for those folks in smaller group practices that are also insurance based. And so um, if you'd like to just, um, you can also email me and we can schedule a time to chat about it to see if you, if it might be a good fit for you or not. But anyway, look forward to uh, hearing from you around that. And uh, be sure to check out our sponsor of the podcast, Therapy Notes. They're the leading electronic health record system for mental health providers. They're who I use in my practice. Absolutely love all the new features that they keep adding. And it's just getting better and better all along. And um, yeah, and that's uh, their support is second to none. And so I can really recommend them. So I know firsthand what sort of a platform it is, and it really does make running your practice much easier. So be sure and check it out, practiceoftherapy.com slash therapy notes. So that's it for this episode. Look forward to being with you again next week. Uh, I've got a lot of great guests lined up. As a matter of fact, we've got a pretty long queue of podcasts that are already recorded. So looking forward to getting those out to you. Um, and be sure to take time to follow us wherever you might be listening to your, your podcast. And also check us out on Instagram. I'd love for you to follow us. Um, doing a lot of fun stuff there on Instagram. And so take care, folks. Uh, and we'll be talking with you here in the next episode. been listening to the practice of therapy podcast with gordon brewer part of the Sightcraft network of podcasts you can find out more about the other great podcasts in the network by visiting sitecraftnetwork.com and if you haven't done so already please visit us at practiceoftherapy.com and get your free private practice startup guide along with a lot of other great resources and webinars and free things just by visiting. 
Also, be sure to follow us wherever you might be listening to your podcasts. This podcast is intended to be educational in purpose and is not intended to give legal, accounting, or counseling advice. If you need a professional, find the right person for that.